Bom dia. Uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you to all the other speakers and, and just the Fruto team. Absolutely amazing experience coming here and listening to how things are really moving over here. Thank you so much. Um, I've been invited to talk, uh, one of the things I do is to talk about um, giving an anthropological perspective on, on all of this and kind of what I've learned and where this can maybe give us some valuable insight into seeing you know, where the world is going or where it ought to be going. It, this journey for me really starts with a personal story. I lived in England for five years and I don't know, you know how well you know English food, but I had a pretty horrible interaction with that. There's nothing wrong with English cuisine, but what you're able to, to access and eat on a daily basis is, is just a disaster. It's a spoiled problem, I know. But this big slab of meat and you know, mashed potatoes, I had to take a bus for 20 minutes just to get to a, a low-end supermarket. I went to a school where all of our, our meals were, were served three times a day to provide no excuses you know, to not do your homework, and I just couldn't stand it. It made me homesick. Uh, I just couldn't stop thinking about that you know, glass of cold milk at my parents' place, or cured herring, or, or fresh carrot. You know, I'm made of cured herring and carrots, and I just missed it so much. Meanwhile, back in Denmark, where I grew up, a movement had started. It was, it was spearheaded by restaurant Noma. It was this idea of, of trying to express the time and place of the landscape of the Nordic region, and really kind of created this whole diaspora of, of ideas about wild food, fermentation, you know, trying the flavors of nature and trying to rediscover our identity of the time and place where we found ourselves. It kind of went into the supermarkets to producers and, and today is really quite a powerful influence on, on how we eat and, and what we're able to buy. There's still a lot of work to do, but, but it has definitely had a massive impact. Just to tell you a little bit about how powerful gastronomy can be in this. And of course, you know, this was something that I was missing out on. I felt like instead of being in this, in this very open environment where I could interact with the world, uh, in the system I was, I, was, I was in was supposed to care for me, but really I just felt it was taking control. So at that point, I was supposed to pick a topic for my, my thesis before graduating, and I decided to ask a question, you know, why is it I take this so personally? Like, wh what is it about this situation that really makes me angry? really feel like someone is intruding on my personality. What is the whole of my, my home and my identity and my relationship to food? Um, and why was it that I missed these flavors of home so badly? And the answer is quite simple. It's because it's meaningful to me. It's where I grew up. And it's, it's really a, a method for me to, you know, and for all of us to reaffirm and express our identity of who we are and where we are and our place in the world. When you eat, when you, when, you, when you take something from nature and transform it into a meal, and you eat it, you take something from the outside, you culture it, and you move it inside. Now, we can't really share the experience of food and flavor physically, so instead we flip it to something that is a social exercise. We do it together, it becomes communality, it's become a cultural uh, thing. So, when you specifically talk about cuisine, not food, cuisine, because cuisine is not food, it is nature that we transform into a social fact. Mary Douglas, a famous anthropologist, talked about dirt. Dirt, she says, is matter that's out of place. It's something that has been displaced. It holds no meaning whatsoever of where it is. And I kind of felt this was a good analogy for how I felt with the food that I was able to interact with. It was just, you know, all over the place. I had no idea where it came from. I had, you know, it didn't really do anything to me. It was completely meaningless to me. And the concept of terroir, of the flavor of where you're from, or from a specific place, be it the microorganisms on a wine, be it a fruit from the Amazon, it, it holds a certain kind of meaning of our home, or to travel somewhere where we are able to taste what that place means. It is an organized social system, and it tells us something about the meaning and the culture of the people and their relationship to the landscape. And it really manifests a vision of where the people who find themselves were you know, imagine themselves to be who they are, who they want to be, or who they ought to be. You see this with immigrants, or people who emigrate, that, you know, even after they lose their language, still three, four generations down the line, they still interact with the, with the local cuisine from home. 
I think Ron Finley put it very well yesterday when he said that to forget how to dig the earth and tend to the soil is to forget ourselves. That there's an opposition between care and control. You know, is the food we eat unhealthy by chance? No, it's by design. Is, you know, is there hunger and, you know, dishonest production or untransparent and, and you know, soil degradation, degrading production and a failed distribution system, is, is that by chance? No, it's by design. Because what we eat today is a function of that system. And I think what's happening now is that we're flipping that and we need to flip that. We need to create a system that is a function of the meal, of culture and of cuisine and not the other way around. And let me tell you how this works. And I'm going to give an example of how to run a business. It could be cities, uh, it could be governments, it could, you know, whatever. But in, the, in this case, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, businesses. Now, the usual excuse from a, from a corporation that produces food is like, we, we just, you know, respond to demand. It's not our responsibility to do anything else than just basically, you know, occupy a place in the market that is available to us. And that's what we want to do. It's all built on this Milton Friedman uh, axiom that the business of business is business. Now, let's talk a little bit about business, because business is not a fact. Business is, is not some objective fact that the universe built for us. Business is just a product of culture, like everything else. It's an idea that has spurred up and is a way that we organize ourselves, organize ourselves in, in uh, communities and in the world. And economic exchange is fundamentally a social system. They're very powerful symbols and influences not just our lives, but to a large extent, the meaning of our life. And I believe that today the influence of this Milton Friedman axiom far exceeds, uh, far exceeds the influence it actually had back then. Because the fundamental cultural premise of a business has changed. Businesses have been so successful in, in, in what they do that, they have, that we as cultures have you know, adopted the sociocultural values of what they propose. We've adopted the symbols of business and consumption and the production of products has become culture. We look at consumer culture. It is a trans or a pan-cultural fact that how we define and identify ourselves across communities, former community, is through what we buy and what we do not buy. It is a way for us to, you know, find alternative identities and to form collective identities, specifically within the creative and cultural economy. This was something that was beforehand occupied by, say, the political class, or by, uh, you know, subcultural movements. Today, to a large extent, it is, it is formed by how we consume and how we do not consume. It is a symbol of power and influence. Famous anthropologist Marcel Mauss defined economic exchange as the exchange of socially alienable objects between socially independent transactors. Since we now identify ourselves, since we now produce culture through our consumptions, this isn't true anymore. Today, economic exchange is the exchange of inalienable objects between socially interdependent uh, transactors. We demand to be able to identify who we interact with. They have been so successful that today it's important to our identity that you know, we need to like these people. If it's a person that is dishonest, someone that's wasteful, something that only talks about themselves, only think about themselves, we kind of don't really want to hang out. We want to do something meaningful, have meaningful relationships, and we want to demand a positive future. So, what's happening now, and what I think that we've heard all day today with many of these fantastic uh, entrepreneurs and, and nonprofits, is that we're designing a new system that puts humans in the center. We don't reduce people to consumers. We're beyond that now. We need to listen, respect, and co-produce. And businesses need to understand that, that you know, profit is just a result, and it's not a strategy, because I believe the business of business today is everybody's business. So, what is a business that puts humans in the center? 
we have this, you know, this concept of globalization, and I think there's an interesting effect of globalization. What has happened is not that we have seen some big, mushy, you know, monocultural thing appearing, just only that all over the world. We, we see that to a large extent, mainly in food, but what we also see are these transnational communities. Like here, I come from Denmark, we share the same values. It has created the opportunity for us to identify with one another across nations. It doesn't really matter anymore where we're from. It's about our values. But the interesting complement complementarity to this is that it also requires us to identify where we're from. I call that production of locality. We need to find a place in the world. I have an analogy for how I think that we can achieve this. I had the opportunity to work alongside architects a few years ago, and I was, I was impressed by how they approached their work. It all starts with a blank piece of paper and a creative vision. The goal is to create a city, or you know, in the future, a planet or a house, where people feel good, where they can relax, or where they can hang out, or where they can be productive, or whatever it is. They need to keep humans in mind. And they have found a way for themselves to interact with engineers, with politicians, uh, cities, to simply execute on that. So they start with a vision, and they have it executed because they know how to work with everyone. Food is the perfect culmination of every single aspect of our society, be it from health, be it to mental health, especially, be it to geopolitics, um, be it to families and communities. But I think that we're missing that core vision in the middle. We, as people, are put at the final end of the equation equation because we have no central creator. We don't have a central vision in the middle that can then go and interact with the externalities to help us execute it. So what that means, because of how we've transformed um, the way we consume, is that really what just needs to happen now and what will happen, what we're seeing and having already, is that create that center, at the center of which is you know, meaning, health, relevant values, you know, something that cares and doesn't control, biodiversity, because that leads to better flavors, creativity, flavor, even science, something that puts humans in the center and allow them and their identity and their culture and their community to express the vision of society and then have the rest follow along. Now, if we do this, this is how we're going to benefit the mind, the health, the people, and the planet, and help us find our home. Thank you.